Welcome to Canucks After Dark. Here are your hosts, Parker Hallowell and Clay Emo. Good evening, Vancouver. It is Wednesday, August 11th, and welcome back to another episode of Canucks After Dark, your weekly source for us trying to fill airtime <laughs> while the Canucks have not a lot going on. Uh, it's going to be a fun show tonight, though. Uh, of course, we love hanging out with you guys here once every week. And of course, as always, joined by my clo- uh, co-host, Canuck Clay. How are you doing, Clay? Parker, I'm doing great today. I hope you are well as well. I'm a little tired. Um, I was actually not much of a hiker. I'm not sure if you've seen pictures of my my physique or my lack thereof. I used to be a good athlete. My kids don't agree, uh, don't always believe me, but <laughs> took the uh, family for a nice three and a half hour jaunt around Bunsen Lake today. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, I think we we're supposed to do it in two and a half hours, but we, we went the scenic route and uh, it was great, though. Um, wonderful family time as I enjoy my second week of vacation at some nice. time in the sun. But uh, no, we had a, uh, it's been, I've been really relaxed. As you know, I'm between exams right now, between courses, uh, doing a bit of vlogging, doing a bit of hanging out with the families and off work for two weeks. So things are good. Thank you for asking. And how are you, my friend? I'm good as well. Um, took a bit of a nice little vacation last weekend. We're back. We're reset. Nice. Uh, didn't miss much, apparently. <laughs> Uh, but we're going to have a good time talking a little bit about uh, a couple of things tonight. But uh, folks in the chat, we might need your help later on. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Before we get started, I don't think I don't think there's anything we got to cover other than uh, hit like on the video, subscribe to the podcast, hit subscribe to the YouTube channel, do all that good stuff, and let's get into our big marquee topic. And thank you, thank you, Elias Pettersson, for doing this interview. <laughs> yesterday or last night or whenever this was in Sweden um, because we actually have something to talk about and Elias Pettersson <laughs> wants to win um, man what a selfish jerk am I right oh I can't <laughs> believe he had the audacity to say what he said today to Ufi Bodin <laughs> yeah honestly winning is kind of for losers nowadays I think uh, I you know I sort of subscribe to the to the Toronto Maple Leafs method you get your paycheck you play for about a week in the playoffs, then you just you just chill all summer, right? Uh, I think that's what Pedersen should really be striving for. <laughs> Why don't you walk our fine uh, fine viewers through what happened this morning, and more importantly, the aftermath? Yeah, it would have been really smart for me to have this pulled up beforehand. Uh, <laughs> but basically, uh, Elias Pedersen had an interview uh, with, as you said. Uh, U- Ufi, Ufe, I don't know how it's pronounced. Yeah, it's got to be Bodine because like Sedine, Rodine, Rodine, Dalin. Yeah. Yes, you got it. Yeah. Got so it. he uh, basically he's a editor in chief for a publication in Sweden, uh, and basically there was two quotes that got translated from this uh, from this conversation. Both of us have had put up videos on this already, <laughs> so um, but now we get to do it together. Yeah. Um, so first question was on how the negotiations are going. So we'll split this into two parts. We'll talk about the first quote and the second quote. Uh, First quote was, quote, my agents do all the talking and they inform me about what's going on. Right now, we're not in an agreement, but I'm not worried that we're not going to be able to solve it eventually. Both parties need to be happy in order to find a solution, but I'm not worried about that. Anything Mm -hmm. here of substance, anything here that scares you? Nothing to see here. Here's a guy that's basically saying, admitting that we all know that the agent does the one, does the negotiating. And they haven't come to agreement yet. And we know that because if they had, we'd be doing vlogs about a new contract. So nothing to talk about this week. That would be great. Nothing to Uh, see here. (laughs) Nothing to see here. Uh, The second part of the quote is what had everyone freaking out. And oh my goodness, some of the reactions online. Um, We'll read the quote first. Okay. Okay. Quote, I want to stay there now, there being Vancouver, but I also want to play for a team that's winning and has the chance to go far into the playoffs every year. Let's start with this first sentence. Um, he wants to play for a team that's winning in the sport that he's worked his entire life trying to be good at. Uh, anything, any problems here so far? No, we know he's uber competitive. I I think I told the story on here uh, when I've seen him on the golf course, like getting mad at a charity golf tournament. That's some of his <laughs> playing partners. We know he's uber competitive. We should be happy that our most talented, most competitive player our future is saying this. So uh, yeah. I'll let you continue, but yeah. Last half of the quote. I feel like we've got a chance to do that next year. 
if we have that chance when my next deal expires, I don't know. I just want to play where there's a chance of winning. So basically what he's saying is, look, this year it's looking decent. Like the team's looking better. I think we have a real chance to compete this year. However, he's looking, whether it's three years down the line, which might be the end of his next contract or six years down the line, we, we don't see the conversations that are happening, but those are sort of the rumors. Um, so he's looking, you know, three years into the future. And maybe, I don't know, maybe he's looking at some of these contracts, the Tyler Myers contracts, the Oliver <laughs> Myers contracts. He's a smart kid, right? Yeah. He sees, like, he has a Twitter account, I'm sure. He look, like he looks at all the Instagram comments. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's saying, you know, when the next deal expires, if this team isn't competitive, well, then maybe when I'm, you know, 26, 27, 28 years old, yeah. I might want to play for a team that has a chance to win. Um, so this has a lot of the Twitterverse sort of freaking out and saying, well, maybe if you want to win, you should help the team win. Um, oh, I get it. He was. Oh, I get it. He was sabotaging us on purpose. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah he wasn't. Yeah, he's yeah. not. He's not a good enough player. Right. <laughs> uh, now, this is the this is the wild thing to me. If you look at um, sort of this caliber of player, and yeah. I'm sort of exaggerating here, but I'm talking like top end players, right? Patterson, McKinnon, Matthews, McDavid. Um, Again, lots of those guys higher caliber than Pedersen, but you know where I'm trying to go here, right? Mm-hmm. These elite, elite players that are the going to be the best player on their team, it's really hard to overpay those players. Yeah. Like you can get like if Connor McDavid was making the max, he'd still be have positive contract value. Like it's absurd. Yeah. Um, a guy like Elias Pedersen, if he's making seven million, if he's making ten million, he's probably still contributing enough to be worth it. But mm-hmm. he's looking sort of at the team and he's looking at, you know, where this money's allocated and history, right? I mean, we have hindsight. We can see, you know, what the team's been doing the last handful of years. And he's looking at them and saying, well, we're going to be good this year. We might not yep. be in, in three years time. And when that time comes, then I'm going to take a look. And yep. he has every, every right to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh- I get and I don't get why Canucks fans are upset or not, I, not all, a few are. Would I have loved him to say something like, um, I'm going to stick with the Canucks uh, through thick and thin for better, for worse? Sure. I, I would I would take that and people would be would be loving him. That's mm-hmm. something like maybe a Bo Horvat would say. And I, I'm not making fun of Horvat. I love Horvat. But I could see Horvat saying something more like that. Yeah. But it, this that's not who PD is. You know, he's not going to sugarcoat. He's not going to lie. And um, I'm not sure if you saw it, actually. The I guess, you know, J.P. Barry, is, his agent, is very close to Rick Dollywall. And Dollywall actually tweeted about, um, he said this about J.P. He says, do not read too much into it. He was not going to say he wants to be part of a losing organization. Right. Elliot says what he feels and he wants to win now, not later. He's excited about next year. So now you got J.P. Barry, his agent, having to come and diffuse things. And last, the other thing I want to say, Parker, you know it's a big story, even though it shouldn't have been a big story. Because on NHL.com, it's like the third headline on the right. PD wants yeah. revenge from last season. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, you got to keep in mind, if if he had said this on July 28th, yeah, uh, in the middle of free agency, people would have been like, yeah, he wants to win. Okay, move on. Let's look at all this other stuff, right? But it's, you know, the heart of the offseason. There's not a lot going on. And, and, you know, people look at this and they see, you know, yeah, this is a player that we really like. And he's a, the future star of this team. And now he might be leaving in a few years. That's scary to people. But if you had had him come out and say, like you said, like, oh, I want to be a Canuck forever. I love the city, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Every, every player that says that is still thinking what he said, right? Every player is thinking like, look, I'm sure Jack Eichel would say, you know, a couple of years ago, like, yeah, I want to be a Buffalo Sabre forever. But, you know, he's looking at it and he's like, okay, well, but if this team keeps sucking, like maybe I don't want to be here forever, (laughs) right? It's the case with everybody, right? They're all going to say that they they love the city that they're in and they want to be a part of this group and have it mature and do all this stuff. But at the end, like in their mind, they're thinking, I want to win some Stanley Cups in my career. Like, that's why I play the game. I'm going to, like, they're going to get paid regardless. I had had someone comment on my YouTube video that said, um, well, maybe if he wants to win, he should take less money. Like, if he takes less money, then that'll help him win. What? So they can go out and sign uh, another Tyler Myers contract or more Jay Beagle or Antoine Roussel contracts? Like, no, he's going to, he can go tomorrow to Colorado and get paid the exact same as he'd get paid here, right? Mm. Pay is pay is not the issue. He doesn't have to take a discount. He's good enough to not have to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he could, 
But that's the one of those scenarios where it's like him and Horvat and Besser and Hughes would all have to sort of come together and be like, we are all going to collectively take a discount so this team right. can win, which isn't going to happen. Yes. Um, so I yes. think that's just a terrible take. Yeah, and I love what you said, your tweet where you said, I guarantee literally every NHL player has had the same thought. Yeah, they all want to win. They're not... Yeah. The, these are players who are, you know, we're, we're literally talking about like the best 600 hockey players in the world that yep. are in the NHL, right? These yep. aren't people who don't have drive, right? They didn't, they didn't, you don't make the NHL without wanting to be really good at hockey and wanting to win. You don't, you don't become an NHL player without being in your backyard, shooting pucks into a garage or a net, picturing it being <laughs> the Stanley Cup winning goal. Like, these are this is a dream that these people have had since they were three years old, right? They're not going to come out and be like, "Yeah, I'm good playing in Arizona. I'm good, yeah. you know, good weather. I get some golf in." Like maybe there's a couple, but yeah. you think what? You think Elias Pettersson is one of those guys? Like no chance. You know the the other thing about this. There's so many layers to this, Parker. Uh, the the other thing is there's already a uh, a small, but there's a minority of fans who. Uh, whether they don't like PD or or I don't know, I don't like too strong of a word, but but hear me out here. Let me let me walk this through. Whether it was the way that he was learning English and a little bit cold to the media in his first one or two years, then didn't he do one of the bar stool or spit and chicklets? Like he did one of those yeah. podcasts, right? So then you had uh, a certain fan base upset at him about that. Then he's uh, some people thinking that he could have played through his injury, but how are we to know how bad his injury was? Then you have a few people noticing when he doesn't mention the Canucks or might have taken them off of their of his social Instagram media. profile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's uh, maybe two don't like him is too strong of a word, but there's there's always people, and I, I see some people mentioning the chat. There's always people looking for something to talk about, something yeah. to complain about, and. Yeah, it doesn't help that he's he's one of the three guys that still need a contract. It doesn't help that uh, out of sight, out of mind, we haven't seen him play for the Canucks since the first week of March. So I, I get it. I, I don't agree with it, but I, I get why people are kind of antsy or kind of on edge or whatever, or COVID numbers going up. People are on edge. Maybe, I don't know. But yeah, it, it made for some news on in the middle of August, the dog days of August, so to speak. Yeah. It gave us something to talk about tonight. Thank God. But uh, <laughs> it's not a story. Even though yeah. we're making a story, it's not a story. That's because there's nothing else to talk about. Uh, <laughs> here's a, I, I really liked your video title. Uh, it, it's your, little, your video title is a little, Elias Pettersson speaks his mind and I love it. And <laughs> I would kind of the same boat too, right? You can look at this from the negative side of like, oh, he might want to leave Vancouver. Or you can look at the positive side. It's like, this kid's going to do anything he can to win. All yeah. he wants is to win. All he wants is the best. Isn't that what we all want too? All we yeah. want is for this team to win. And, uh, you know, I uh, totally, I, I, I love it as well. It's, it's competitive drive. It's a little risky for mm -hmm. us, but, uh, you know, I, I'd rather him say that than be like, I'm okay with how things are going. You know what? Ah, I'm, I'm making my my paycheck. Things are going to be fine, right? That, yeah. that that's not what we want to see. We don't want to see these, you know, the people who just go there and don't really try on a night to night basis. Like he wants to win. He's going to do everything he can to win. And I think yeah. that's a really good sign for you know his upcoming season. For sure. Let me let let me know what you think about this, Parker. I've seen some people say, and I I, I say I agree with it, but I don't think it's like the the strongest point ever. But that it it kind of publicly even unintentionally puts a little pressure on jim benning i say it's not the strongest point because i think benning's got enough pressure on himself already he he knows that he, we saw what he did this offseason but it's almost like now a star player has said in the media that that he wants to win not just this season but going forward or maybe there's nothing to it i don't know but i just saw some people talking about that point as well i think it gives us a bit of a peek behind the curtain on to what happened this offseason right uh, okay um, yeah because because I guarantee that either Elias Pettersson or his agent has said this to Benning already, right? He's already right. like Benning has already got the memo that yeah, Petter if Pettersson's not on a winning team, he's going to want out in a few years, right? Mm. Potentially. Uh, so I'm my thought is well, maybe Jim Benning was told this, and maybe he's heard this from other players like uh, like Horvat, uh, like Bester who has a contract up next year. Um, and maybe they've said, you know, we're tired of losing. Like, let's let's do something here and get this team going, or we might want out eventually. And mm. you know, that can sort of drive the because because you know our sort of narrative, and this was sort of my thought was, 
let's just look, this year's going to suck, but we're going to get rid of the, the Beagle, Roussel, Erickson contracts. <laughs> and then next year we have literally a fresh $20 million in cap space with the Luonga recapture. Uh, yeah. and everything's going to be great. Um, but if you have these, you know, these guys coming in and saying like, look, if we don't win some games this year, like we're just kind of done with the team. Well then, you know, you go out, you get Connor Garland, you get Ekman Larson, you, you know, you make all these moves, you get Jason Dickinson. Um, and that starts to, you know, hopefully, you know, part of it might be Jim Benning trying to keep his job and part mm -hmm. of it might be Jim Benning trying to keep this core together. Yes. No, nope. all good points. So, Hmm. I think you'd agree. You and I agree that uh, although it gave us some good content, and I'm not saying we have to shut this part down now if you want to keep talking about, it, but there's really nothing to see here. Yeah. Uh, do you think this impacts your thoughts on what his contract will end up being? You know, that's interesting. So my short answer is no. Actually, it's interesting. I just I was with a guy named uh, Twisted Rister Hockey, a YouTube channel. He was we were talking about the Canucks, and he asked me the exact same question, and I. I I think this puts admittedly more pressure on the next contract, whenever that is. Uh, I, I, I still think that we know there's only so much money for Pedersen, Hughes, and, and Dickinson that they already know they're getting a short versus long. Then they can figure out the minutia of the of the money. But I, I'm not sure to me if it adds any more uh, whatever um, to this current negotiation. Do you? Um, my first instinct was, you know, maybe it kind of pushes jim benning's mind to think more long term and it might push uh, elias Pettersson's mind to think more short term oh interesting um, so i think that might be you know could be a, some indication on sort of the gap in in what's taking so long but again i don't i don't know that that's just sort yeah. of that was just sort of my my gut opinion was like okay well it sounds like Pettersson wants a shorter term deal so he has a sooner chance to yeah. you know because if he takes a three-year deal and then he's only one year from rfa he can say yeah give me a one-year deal that's all i'm taking and then i'm going away and i'm sure for agency <laughs> um, or, and then, you know, the Canucks might be like, okay, well, let's lock them down for the next six. So that way we just know we have them, um, yeah. which also might make that sort of UFA year price go up, um, potentially. But again, I'm just, yeah. just sort of spitballing here. You know, you said something that I think is worth exploring and I think we should spend a few minutes on it. Can you please type up? Cause you're so quick in a banner. Are players happy here? Question mark. And I'll start us off. Are players happy here? Question mark. <laughs> I bring this up because. Uh, Travis Green did a really good interview with Thomas Drance for the solo now, for now, for the van cast. And one of the questions that Drance asked him was about Nate Schmidt. And Travis Green kind of avoided it, but we've seen um, how the Schmidt experience failed, how Holtby wasn't himself, how, um, you know, even the, uh, there's an inkling of this in, in, pit, the, in the tone of Pedersen's words. And I I just think that last year, of course, no one could have predicted COVID, but you can certainly, you can only control what you can control, right? Yeah. Um, and maybe the Canucks team, organization management, within their, their sphere of control may, and influence, maybe they didn't do everything that they could have. I don't know. I don't know anything. I'm not speculating. Well, I guess I'm speculating. <laughs> I don't know any of this to be true, but you got to imagine that last year was tough, yet yeah. um, what's going to be the emergence from it? And and how much of a toll did it take enough where a guy like Schmidt, the happiest guy we've seen in here in years, actually asking to leave perhaps like, I don't know, man, it's just something I think we need to keep our eye on. Yeah. And I think that's another sort of angle. You can look at this, these quotes from Pedersen from is yeah. Pedersen's making this, these quotes after a, just a terrible set of circumstances all around this season, right? If this season goes well, he might like his tune would <laughs> likely be completely changed because it's just, there's going to be fans in the stands. There's going to, yeah. they're not all going to get sick. They're like just so many things uh, that sort of add on uh, to that. Also, you mentioned the van cast, by the way, um, our audio is way better than theirs. Uh, so that's why yeah, we're the best. <laughs> It's weird, and I, to get a mic. That's all I'm saying. I even I actually I messaged him once because I heard him on Sakaris and Price and he sounded crystal clear. And I'm sure he wasn't in studio. He phoned in. But yeah, it's like he's using what what do you think he's using? Like a laptop my laptop mic or something, okay. it sounds like, but I don't know. Yeah. Um anyways, let's go on <laughs> to the next topic, uh, which hopefully we can we can milk a little bit. Olio Levy signing a contract that is lower than his qualifying offer was. Wow. At one year, seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, one-way contract, which is better than his qualifying offer because it's a one-way. 
Um, for those of you who don't know, maybe you've only played like the EA NHL games where that just sort of has to do with waivers. All it has to do with is does he get his full money in the AHL as he does in the NHL? So this means even if he plays the entire season in Abbotsford, he still gets his full paycheck, which doesn't affect the team at all. Uh, just Francesco. Um, yeah. So it's a one-way contract, and he is waiver eligible. So this does have some lineup implications, right? Um, there's a lot of people saying, well, Yulevi is going to just sit in the press box all year because they're not going to want to put him on waivers. Um, there's a there's another subset of people that are saying, well, Oli Yulevi is going to clear waivers, especially on that like one day before the season where there's like a hundred people on waivers. <laughs> like you put him on there on that day, like no one's going to pick him up. Heck, uh, you and I can go on waivers that day, even. Yeah. I think we could go on waivers any day and we'd clear. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I like what's what are you, what are your thoughts on how this sort of impacts the lineup? Uh, does that have any merit, uh, or are the Canucks going to just be willing to put them on waivers? Yeah, great. Oh, oh, so this is good. Let let's break it down in, in a two ways, Parker. Let's talk about the contract itself first, sure. uh, value, and then let's talk about uh, lineup. So. Uh, great explanation. I, I like to say one way means you get paid one way. No matter where you're playing, you're only going to get paid 750 grand. You're going to get paid one way, whereas two way, yeah, you can get paid one of two ways. Either make a lot of money or make not that much money when you're when you're in the minor. So the fact that he got a one way contract, that's why exactly what you said. That's why he got he took a number lower than his qualifying offer because he was guaranteed that 750 no matter where he plays, even if he plays as you said. Where so contract wise, I was slightly surprised. I knew he's going to come in at a million or less. There's no way that the Canucks were going to pay him more than that. So um, it makes sense now with this one way why it was less than his qualifying offer. Having said that, then um, before we get into lineup, I guess is this because he only got one year? Is this another type of those show me contracts, Parker, where he's going to by hook or by crook show the Canucks like earn a better contract for the next one? Yeah. So to go off of so his qualifying offer would have been like eight seventy four. Okay. So basically one hundred and twenty five K less. Uh and part of it to me is, well, he didn't show much last year. He didn't play a lot last year. Um and the Canucks also brought in a ton of defensive depth, right? Yule Levy went from being like, you know, maybe like the number seven, number six, number seven, like he'd actually play a good chunk of games. And yeah. then they brought in a bunch of guys to sort of just bump him, bump him, bump him down. So he still has a shot at earning a, a spot in the lineup, but instead of going from like 875 K in the NHL and then like, you know, a quarter of that in the HL or whatever the calculation is now yeah. he's guaranteed this money. So this sort of makes sense as to why he wouldn't accept his qualifying offer. He takes a little bit less money. Yeah. Um, and this also means that, um, his money is less than what would get buried by someone getting sent to the AHL, right? So if you had another guy on your blue line, maybe making a million dollars, you would save money by sending that person down instead of Yule Levy because Yule Levy is only going to count 750 against your cap and you can bury someone's million dollars down there. So, so like, I don't know, there's not really any great options, but like Luke Shen, for example, Sending him down to the AHL and then calling you a levy up would save 100k off the cap, for right. example. Uh, Shen makes 850, is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay. So um, that's sort of one element to it. Uh, the other yeah. element is, you know, the waivers. Does he get to play? Because yeah. I don't think I don't think he's in the top six right now. Um, yeah. You know, Actually, I that's good. Let's right? let's talk about that left side then. Yeah, because we, yeah. we know Ekman Larson and Hughes. We know they're one two. Whatever order I put them in. So it's basically three guys battling for that third spot. You're right. It's your levy. It's Jack Rathbone, who I think prior to this Brad Hunt signing, you and I had penciled in as our, our third pairing guy over Yulevi. And then mm-hmm. there, now there's Brad Hunt, so there's who's a veteran who everyone likes to say he's barely played in the AHL because he's always found his way onto a main roster. And that's not even counting Luke Shen, who plays on the right side. So you could actually roll out a Shen Hunt third pairing that's quite you know NHL you know, battle-tested. So we're looking at three guys battling for one spot, Rathbone, Yulevi, and Hunt. And with the Rathbone thing, it's interesting. He is not waiver eligible. He is exactly. exempt. So you can send him down, bring him up, make him dance around, do whatever, and you don't have to worry about losing him. And to Rathbone's unfortunate, maybe misfortune, that means he's actually the easiest to put in Abbotsford. Yep. He also has the highest value contract. So the Canucks would save the most money at 925 k wow. They would save the most money by putting him in the AHL. And also, Jack Rathbone looked really good. Yeah. But... 
I mean, he's 22. It wouldn't be terrible for him to play 22 minutes a night in Abbotsford, especially when he's literally an hour and a half away, right? Yes. So if something, if they do want to have him play a Friday night in Abbotsford, then have him play Saturday in Vancouver, totally doable. Um, so I think, you know, this sort of signals that, that Rathbone's going to potentially be sent to Abbotsford. It depends on how much they value having Brad Hunt and Olio Levy in the organization uh, yeah. just to, to sort of keep them from, from leaving. Um, and then, yeah, so then you, you sort of are stuck with one of Brad Hunt or Olio Levy being in the lineup and the other being in the press box on a nightly mm -hmm. basis. Yeah, uh, that's really interesting because you're right. Rathbone is making 925, Hunt's 800, and Yulevi's 750. So all three guys making sub 950 with the one guy, Rathbone, the least experienced, the youngest, being the only one who does not have to, you know, clear waivers. Wow, that is fascinating. I, man, and I, I just see Hunt beating Yulevi out, right? Like yep. if, if training camp was today, I, I just have that feeling that Hunt's going to beat Yulevi out. So could we see Hunt? Close. Yeah, so could we see Hunt? On the third pairing with a, either a Pullman or a Myers, and then Yolevi in the press box, and then Rathbone down in Abbotsford. That's crazy. Like, I would have never thought that a month ago. I'm thinking just asset wise, because yeah. having Yolevi as your seventh defenseman is just sort of an, just bad all around, right? <laughs> because Yolevi doesn't get to play, and he yeah. needs to play because from his limited viewings that we've had of him, he's not there yet. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's sort of on his last legs, right? Like this, this is sort of it this year. So if he plays 20 games this year and spends 60 in the press box, right. Only comes in for the occasional injury that doesn't help anybody because the Canucks are spending all this work retaining this asset that is dwindling by the day, right? The less games that he plays, but you send him to the AHL, maybe he gets claimed by another team plays, you know, 70 games for them, you know, like in Arizona or something with maybe doesn't have such defensive depth where he would be like the sixth best defenseman. He can go in and play NHL games. So I think personally, I don't value you levy that highly, right? Yes. He was a, a high draft pick, you know, five years ago or whatever. Um, that doesn't mean that he's good. Right. And we've sort mm -hmm. of seen that like he's, he, he probably isn't going to cut it. So I think my best strategy would be send you a levy to the AHL on that day where everyone gets sent to the AHL, right? Yeah. Um, because there's going to be other options for teams to claim on the defensive side, right? And hope he clears. And if he does, then you play him on your top pair in Abbotsford. He plays 60 games and he plays 22 minutes a night. And then you can have Brad Hunt and Jack Rathbone. You don't have to develop Brad Hunt, right? He's 32. You know, you're you're fine if he sits, sits in the press box sometimes. There are going to be the occasional injuries. And I think you just sort of run Rathbone and Hunt. Now, again, I don't like not having Rathbone play games. Um, so I hope that Rathbone would then earn a spot. And I think this really comes out of training camp. If Rathbone is good enough to play in the NHL this year, then you keep Rathbone up and you put him on that third pairing because having Brad Hunt in your press box you don't have to worry about his development. He's going to be able to come in. Remember Alex Biega? You could leave him in the press box for 30 games in a row. He'd come in. He'd play excellent back to the press box, right? Like that's sort of how I envision, envision the perfect Brad Hunt scenario is that Rathbone is good enough to play uh, in that sixth spot. Yuel Levy goes and just plays every game in the AHL. And then we have Brad Hunt just in the press box in case of injury. You know, when you lay it out like that, Parker, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, yeah, if you you could, because I, I see the Canucks carrying thirteen forwards, eight D, right of the, of the twenty one skaters. So, because I think you want to keep Luke Shen up up on the right side as your extra guy there. So maybe even if you're if not, it's not a perfect rotation. I'm not saying one game, one game, but maybe you put in Rathbone or Hunt depending on what kind of look you want to give. But that makes a lot of sense. You're right. If you if you put Sandy Le you levy down on that day where fifty to hundred other guys are going down, as you said he won't be at the top of anyone's pecking order. And yeah, where we talk about Rathbone not needing waivers and playing 60 games, 20 minutes a night, maybe you think of it as you'll let me doing that instead. And then Hunt's only here for one year, then he goes. And then now you have a battle perpetually of, with you and Rathbone for that third pairing slot behind um, Hughes and Ekman Larson every season going forward. I, I, mm -hmm. I'd be on that, by the way, my, uh, my best, uh, a couple of my best friends, they live in Maple Ridge. They, uh, Brad Hunt's family, 
lives on their street, which is kind of cool. Mm. So apparently they've seen him like driving around down their, their, their street uh, since he's been uh, acquired by the Canucks, which is kind of cool. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it sort of ends up being you're going to have um, Brad Hunt be the six or seven, and you're going to have either Rathbone or Yule Levy, one of them up, one of them down, right? Yes. I think that's just sort of how it's going to end up being. And you really have to pick. You know, which one do you want to play 30 games in the NHL? And the other one's going to play, you know, 50 games on the top pair in the AHL, right? You're just going to, you, that's that's sort of the way it is. You're going to have yep. to pick one. Uh, Rathbone is the safer one to send to the AHL. But I also think Rathbone is really, really good. And I think he can actually help this team win, which is what this team needs. Yes, he's got the higher upside. He was probably more impressive in, in his limited audition last season. And he brings something. Remember that nice goal he scored, I think, in his first yep. or second game where he just... He was so patient right in the slot. He made a quick deke or a quick fake. I can't remember, but he put the puck yeah. in. He is so calm with the puck. And, and yeah, you levy. there are good parts to his game. He's got a good first pass. He's smart. Uh, no one's ever claimed, uh, you know, doubted his, his hockey IQ. Just slow. And he just, um, yeah. not decision-making, just slow on it. And the opposite of basically Rathbone. <laughs> yep. Yeah, he doesn't have the foot speed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Rathbone's patience on that, especially the, the one goal that we saw where – you know, he was really patient. He he picked up the puck and, you know, just the awareness to step into the slot, make a move, take a quick shot. You know, it's something that we we, we don't we wouldn't see from you, Levy at this point. Right. So, um, so and we wouldn't see from a lot of guys, uh, you know, we wouldn't see that from like Hamannick probably. Um, so I think that's it really adds a nice little scoring flair uh, onto the onto the defense there. Absolutely. And Parker, I'm let you take it while I figure out what's going on with my AirPods. No worries. Uh, well, another quick topic. This one is not super interesting. Uh, Jason Dickinson's arbitration is set. Uh, his date is set for next Friday, August 20th. And all this really does is it sets a hard deadline, right? Uh, we talked about this for a couple minutes last week on, on basically what the arbitration means. Basically, two uh, player and agent team will go together in a meeting room with a neutral third party. They will each argue why the player will argue why he deserves this amount of money. The team will argue why he deserves way less money. The guy in the middle will say, all right, this is the number. And you guys now have a contract. Um, neither team or player really ever want to get to this. Uh, so, but the, but it's, it's one of the player's main pieces of leverage is to uh, file for arbitration, which Dickinson did every right uh, for him to do that. And now they basically have a hard deadline set where it's, if we don't want to go to arbitration, we don't want to start this new relationship um, in basically a courtroom, <laughs> then we have until August 20th to sort out terms, sort out money, get it all written up. Uh, so I think we're probably looking at a Jason Dickinson contract within the next eight days or so. I'd agree with you. And I think we made the point and it was a good point last, last week that we made that um, at least he's never played for the Vancouver Canucks. Right. So it's not like you're going in there, you're trashing them or you're, or you're making, not making fun of them, but you're, you're almost devaluing it, arbitration. So silly, man, you, here you are trying to sign a guy to your team, whether he's played for you or not. Mostly in most cases, it's a guy who's, who's played for you. He'd just come off a contract and then you're basically going to grind them down and, and, and tell them, tell them, Tell everyone yeah. in the room why you don't think he's worth anything, like uh, worth as much as he wants. But at least the, all the stats they're using, it was when he played with Dallas. All the comparables they're using, fine. But there, there's at least no history that you really have to worry about. You, but you're right. You still have to worry about the relationship going forward. It's not mm -hmm. like it's going to be unmendable or anything because they're just starting the relationship. But you do want to start off on a good foot for sure. Yeah, and usually what we see with these is – uh, you'll see the tweets on the day of the hearing, if it does get to that. And it'll be like, uh, team is putting forward $2 million is what they're willing to pay. <laughs> Player says he wants 4.25. <laughs> and every time it is exactly in the middle. <laughs> like yeah. it's within like 200K in the middle. So um, I think it's going to be something like that. Team's going to say like two. Player's going to say like four and a half. And it's going to end up being like three and a quarter. And right. we're just everyone's going to be happy and move on. Uh, so if Dickinson was, was smart then, and if he wants three million, and he thinks the team's going to say two, then really Ask he should for eight. say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll get five, and you're look, you're great. And then we can't sign Petey. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's uh, 
I, I'm not too concerned about this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Most, I think last year, what was it? 19 filed and one went through to arbitration or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, and when it does, it's usually not that big of a deal anyways. Um, yeah, yeah. But no, something but to keep track yeah. of. So you said it's a week from uh, a week from Friday. Friday. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Next quick topic. Um, legendary Canucks goaltender. Uh, Anders Nilsson retiring from yes. the game of hockey, uh, had a, a nice stint here backing up Jacob Markstrom, uh, where they're basically the same person. Uh, and, uh, and he's, he's calling it at, I think he's only 31. Yeah. Twin towers for sure. I, and I think we've all seen those pictures of those memes of, uh, <laughs> Nilsson and Markstrom coming back for, from, for training camp. And there, I think they're only one inch, uh, shorter Markstrom is. But yeah. didn't Nilsson look like just jacked? Yeah. So <laughs> was that a camera that, trick or what was going on there? I don't know. There's the picture of them both literally sitting next to each other. Um, I mean, Nilsson is like 30 pounds on Markstrom, uh, but it's only one is taller, but they're sitting literally next to each other. And, and Nilsson, I think the, 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 the one was like, it's like Captain America before the serum and after the serum, basically what it looks like. Uh, but yeah, played two seasons for the Canucks, only a total of 39 games. It felt like more than that. Mm -hmm. Um, but at 898, 895, something yeah. like that, save percentage that he played for Ottawa was actually good for Ottawa in, in a backup role. 24 games, two years ago had a 914 save percentage. And then last year he had a 908. Uh, oh. so clearly has it in him to be a, a solid backup in the NHL. Um, but, uh, that was it for him. Yeah. Wasn't there a story Parker, a couple of, a few seasons ago when he was with, Vancouver, where I think Travis Green was reaming him out at practice. That was him. It wasn't yeah, Markstrom, right? I think it was him, yeah. It was Nielsen, yeah. I'm, yeah. Obviously, I'm not saying that's why he only played whatever games for us. Yeah, you know, obviously, even though he's bigger than Markstrom, technically, Markstrom should be in Nielsen's shadow, but he was it was Markstrom's backup and uh, potential there when they were together. The the biggest goaltending tandem we've ever had, for sure. <laughs> they were mm. mass, they're massive. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he was always, uh, tr truly, he was... Um, uh, figuratively in Markstrom's shadow the whole time that he was here. Yeah, and it's unfortunate. I, I just looked and it's uh, he's retiring due to post concussion symptoms uh, oh. and, and neck issues. So, uh, you know, it, it sucks when you when you see you know he he had more in him, right? I mean, you look yeah. at his stats and you can say, yeah, this guy could be a backup for another three four years in the NHL. Backup of the NHL nowadays, right? You're making one and a half two million dollars, right? So call in another five million bucks that he's not able to go out and earn because mm -hmm. of these injuries that he's had. And, you know, obviously you just hope that uh, not playing helps them heal to the point where it doesn't impact uh, later on in life. Yeah. Great point. And I was looking at actually at some of his contracts cause I, I just didn't know, I know he wasn't making like Marshall or Demko money, five or 6 million, but I, I knew he wasn't making like, you know, chump change. None of these guys are. So yeah, mm -hmm. his, his last contract was, uh, you know, 2.8 and then 2.4. So he did, he did well. He did fine. And yep. yeah, it's too bad that you hear about any type of uh, injury that that end your career sooner than, than you want it to. And especially all injuries are bad, but anything with the head, the concussion, we're seeing that with Michael Furland too. It's, it's very scary. Yeah. Have you had any concussions by the way that you know of? I was just yep. curious. Yeah, I had, uh, I think I've probably had two or three. Okay. Um, Hockey very, yeah. Very minor ones though. Nothing too, too bad. Uh, yeah, I had I had one in roller hockey. A guy caught me with uh, it wasn't even his fault. I think I fell into him. But then my son Sean had a one in football right after, like, like three months later. Mm -hmm. And I was actually grateful, Parker, that I went through that experience a little bit first, so I could at least help him. Yeah, Although his his was actually because he got hit by someone dirty. Where mine was, I actually fell into someone's knee. I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, all right, we have two more mini topics here. Uh, news coming out that the salary cap is going to go up a really tiny bit next year. Uh, so Canucks cap flexibility will get just a little bit better uh, for next season, a mere $1 million of raise. Now, we were getting really used to these like $3 million a year, yeah. right? It went from like 75, 78, 81 and a half, and then COVID hits, and then we get the three years of flat cap. Uh, but they are going to just give it a little boost, eighty-two and a half million next year, so uh, a little bit better, um, well below inflation. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, a little bit extra space. 
Yeah, so Petey's uh I, Petey was very strategic in his comments today. No, I, I'm sure it had, yeah. nothing to do with, <laughs> it had nothing to do with that. But it, it's funny, you know, we, we talk about the salary cap now going up to 82.5. And then I'm looking at, uh, you know, I'm going with this uh, cap friendly with dead cap. And we know that we have Hope be at 1.9. We have Vertanen at 500. So we have 2.4 in dead cap. And we could have up to 1.5 in the Yaroslav Halak bonuses. So we could like have up to... Yeah, exactly. So we could have up to three point nine million dollars in quote uh, whatever dead money next season. Oh, so yeah, just like the, just when we get off the Luongo contract, perfect. Exactly. So every little bit helps. One million, we will take it. So, so th- what's interesting is, and I'm glad you told. I didn't even know about this. Um, this is in contrary to what they were saying about it not going up for a couple of years. Obviously, right? Yeah, I think yeah. this yeah. is. I think this is just like a. Sorry, guys. Here's a here's a little more. Right. I think that's all it is. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't think it's uh, really indicative of things going better than they expected. Uh, last one. This will be fun. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. The Toronto Maple Leafs Amazon Prime series launching in October, all or nothing, uh, which was announced at the beginning of this last season, basically saying they were going to just uh, sort of like hard knocks in the NFL. Okay. We're basically just going to follow the Maple Leafs around with a documentary crew for the season. Uh, the trailer came out today. Will Arnett's going to be doing the voiceover for it. It looks actually really good. Yep. Um, all the memes on Twitter was like, yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> it's basically uh, sort of the, <laughs> the common sentiment. Uh, but I am really looking forward to this. Uh, October 1st is when it drops. Uh, it looks really well produced, uh, even though yeah. you know I don't like the Leafs. It will be fun to revel in their pain. Um, not yeah. like things are going much better here. Uh, yeah. But uh, will definitely be a, a fun watch. Yeah, I uh, Parker, I love these kind of things. Whether they're uh, yeah, these documentaries or uh, you know, the Last Dance, my, uh, Michael Jordan, any type of th- things where, you, as we talked about, pulling back the curtain and just even that one motivational speech by that coach or that that player or the one contract negotiation uh, or whatever, I, I I really like that kind of thing, and I think it makes any sport more accessible to um yeah to to your fan base so i love this and um you know it, it's what's really interesting is i've heard on good authority from a few sources that the vancouver canucks were producing um a documentary capturing their 2011 cap run a uh, cup run excuse me oh wow but they decided not to air not to finish it because of it wasn't a happy ending like wow, that um, would have been that would have been a wild yeah, thing. yeah. Wouldn't I, that be cool to see? Like, obviously, if we'd have to win, and then yeah, that, and since it was since it. it was produced internally, right? It makes sense yes. that they that they decided against it. But Amazon put money into this; they did everything themselves, right? It was a deal with the yeah. NHL, not with the Leafs. So uh, they were going to run it anyways. Um, yeah, and yeah, it looks really, really good. So, what are you look? Are you looking forward to like seeing how Austin Matthews decides what to wear every day, or like what are you most looking forward to? I'm just show? interested in the behind the curtains, right? Because all yeah. we see is like you know this. Uh, this sort of poster boy, Kyle Dubas, you know, the, the young gun GM. And, and I'm interested to see, they, they had a clip of him, um, a clip in the trailer. Uh, he's, I don't remember exactly what the quote is, um, but it was a good quote. Uh, and I'm just excited to see sort of a more like edgier side uh, to Kyle Dubas uh, and just sort of everyone, right? Like the behind the scenes, because we don't really see what happens in, you know, in NHL locker rooms and things like that. Yep, absolutely. No, thanks for it. Well, I didn't know about this uh, this new series, so I'll probably check it out at least for a little bit. It'll be a fun watch. Yeah. Um, all right. It is 1043. We actually did a lot better than we expected. We expected yeah. this to we expected to talk for like 25, 30 minutes and then jump over to you guys. But we do have a good chunk of you guys in here. So if you do have some questions or some topics that we missed, which seems unlikely, but if we did miss any, let us know yeah. right now. And we can chat about those. Or if you just have any like fun questions. Um, also, I do want to tease uh, again. We haven't, we're not doing this next week. We're going to save this sort of the beginning of the season, but I did kind of mention it last week. I've put together a list of sort of prop bets for everyone in the chat here to bet on for the season. Uh, everyone will be able to sort of pick like, for example, one of the questions will be like, how many points is Niels Oglander are going to get right. Mm-hmm. And you can guess the number and closest gets the most points and so forth. Uh, and there's a bunch of those and we'll give a prize out to the winner at the end of the season. Uh, so stay tuned for that in a couple of weeks 
time. Awesome. I can't wait. Good. Give me some time to do some research. Uh, you can actually put up Lucas's first about my cousin Dusty because I, I do want to address it really quickly, if that's okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, um, Lucas, thank you for asking it. I, I've decided not to comment publicly on it. Only, uh, th And this is what I will say. If I, uh, I won't rehash the whole story, but if I agree with even any sentiment of what Dusty said, I'm not saying that I do, then um, I, I think I would get raked pretty bad. But if I disagree with him, and but uh, it's not in my nature to disagree because I, I want to be there for him as family. So all to say, for those of you who know that story, uh, Dusty hired by the Toronto Marlies, then it was re rescinded because of some tweets that he didn't write but that he liked. Um, I, important thing is I've reached out to him. He's, re he's, he's responded, and in due time, uh, I'll, I'll be chatting with him as a cousin not as a vlogger, not as someone who needs to break his story, but it's unfortunate all around. And all I hope for him is that he gets a shot to coach one day in the NHL or AHL because his quality of coaching um, demands it. Like he's that good. And there, there's a reason why that the biggest organization in the NHL was going to hire the, him uh, to be their goaltending development coach working with their farm team. So Lucas, no problem with you asking it. I, I respect that you, you've you asked and you've actually reached out to me directly. Thank you. Park and I talked about it a little bit before this, but uh, that's all I'll say for now. And maybe more will come out later, but I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Parker. Perfect. No worries. Let's go to the next one. I like this question from Noah. Looking back, do you like the Gaudet Highmore trade once again? So when this <laughs> trade happened, this was funny because um, I thought the Canucks could have got more. And lots of people said, well, I mean, he Gaudet doesn't really have much of a future in the league. And, and I mean, we kind of, I've kind of said that since, right? Where I was like, well, he's either going to be a second line player. Or he's not going to make it at all. Uh, in hindsight, even though, you know, not much has happened recently. Uh, what's your, what's your take? Yeah. I, I'm not just saying this because he's gone now out of sight, out of mind, but I, I do not miss Adam Gaudet. I, I, I just don't. And I think if Matthew, maybe we shouldn't look at it this way. If Matthew Highmore was the one that we lost, that we were, that we left unprotected and, and uh, from a standpoint of, um, that we lost him to, as opposed to Cole Lynn, to Seattle. Right. And you're like, oh, we traded, you know, Adam Gaudet away for a guy who's not even with our team anymore. So, Highmore, he, he's got a chance to make good. He's going to battle for that last forward spot, that last right wing spot with Mott and Sutter. And maybe he makes it, maybe he doesn't. But um, I saw enough of Highmore, his hustle, his, his grit last season, where I think he can be an everyday contributor. Uh, uh, maybe more consistent, but not as flashy as Gaudet. How's that? Yeah, and I think I think if the Canucks still had got it, he probably gets picked by Seattle. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I don't think that was a big impact there. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I it's one of those things where it's such a minor swap, and now that Jason Dickinson's in the fold, I don't think it really matters. Yeah, uh, Godet wouldn't have made this team. Uh, I don't think at, at the current stage that they're at. Um, right. Just because he wouldn't have really had a had a spot. Yeah, he's not going to beat out Sutter or Dickinson. You're right. You're right. Uh, does Tucker Pullman own a pool? <laughs> Asks GL Rebirth. Yeah, well, pool man, maybe he's just really good at jumping into them. Uh, maybe or he maybe cleans pools. Yeah, maybe he wins hockey pools. Like it might not even be the pool that we're thinking about. Maybe he's really good at what's called billiards. Is that yeah? Mm. So um yeah. This is like when people ask me if I'm good at parking cars. <laughs> Uh, I get that all the time. Uh, <laughs> or they ask me if I milk cows because they, they, they mispronounce my last name and they say I'm or, yes. or, or, or if they ask me if I'm as uh, emo, like emotional, or as you saw on Twitter a couple days ago, if I'm related to the Australian bird. Yes. Yes. Emo. That was hilarious. There was a, for those of you who missed it, there was a Reddit thread on the Canucks subreddit asking what your favorite Canucks related podcast was. And this one. a bit down the list, someone <laughs> said Canucks after dark, uh, Parker Pucks and Clay, uh, Clay, Clay Ewe, like the bird, uh, so oh, like EMU. Bird, EMU, uh, are both have good YouTube channels or something like that. And it was hilarious. Yes. I loved it. And there was a good, good little Twitter discourse on it, uh, which was, which was fun. Love it. Love it. Um, Oh, uh, this is kind of interesting from Justin, uh, Kaprasov. This was a uh, this was a weird report that came out, mm. uh, and it was basically Sarah Valley saying that uh, uh, CSK Moscow had put an offer, a tentative offer to Kaprasov, one year, ten million U.S. dollars to come play in the KHL for a year. Uh, this was wild because basically Minnesota, I mean Minnesota is not going to pay him ten million dollars. Um, 
so he has the option to go back to Russia for 10 million, but then other people were saying, well, the salary cap in the KHL is literally $13 million, right? <laughs> like this is all of their cap. Then other people are saying it's Russia. They'll give them a garbage bag full of money. Like, <laughs> so, and it's, you know, it's, it's like one of the biggest teams in Russia. Um, what's your sort of first thought on that? Yeah, you know, I did not. I just see some of the the comments about yeah, whether it's fake or what you just said about the the KHL salary cap. Regardless of it's if it's ten million or or whatever, if, if loud or not, it's got to put a bit of pressure on the Wild. They they how are they gonna not? How are they gonna walk away from a uh, Calder Trophy winner, even though he's kind of old? But play, yeah. yeah, you can't, you can't. He's and yeah, he is. He's their best player already. So what what are you gonna do? Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, apparently yes. the initial hangup was that Minnesota was only interested in a seven or eight year deal. Like they said, like, look, we want you long term forever. And he basically said, Minnesota, though, <laughs> like, I mean, Minnesota is not a team that's going to be contending anytime soon. Right. With the yeah. big, big, big bias, which we talked about a handful of weeks ago uh, of Suter and Parise. Um, mm. So, you know, now apparently Minnesota, after seeing this, is more willing to look at sort of a medium term deal. Um, <laughs> I would. Yeah, I think if if Kaprasov leaves for the KHL, like, this is a big loss for the Wild and just for the league yeah. in general, uh, yes. losing a big star to the KHL. Absolutely. Can you put up Jonathan Wu's? Um, perfect. This is interesting. They just named John Cooper as the head coach of Team Canada. Why not? He's won two back to back cups. Um, yeah, that's what back to back means too. Yes. I've seen, yeah, even before they named Cooper, even, well, we don't even know if the NHL is going to Olympics. They've made a schedule that has them going to Olympics. They've made a schedule that has them not going. I've seen Horvat on 50, not that there's a lot of these mock rosters, but I've seen Horvat on 50% of them. So he's not a lock. You know, he's not a McKinnon or Crosby or McDavid. However, um, the ones I see him on, they have him not as a center because usually with Team Canada, you have about seven or eight All centers. centers. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and everyone else has to play somewhere else. But I've seen him as a, whatever, left or right winger, left winger, he shoots left, um, a fourth line left winger on half of the projections. I, I I could see it happening very easily. Like, I could see it not happening too, but why not? We, we want him to do it. And um, if he continues to, to have a good season, if and especially if the team is better, more eyes going to be on him. I could see it happening for sure. Yeah, it's tough, right? Because you look at... Um, sort of the other options, right? Like, are yeah. you bringing in Bo Horvat over like John Tavares or mm -hmm. Matt Barzal or Sean Couturier or Yanni Gourd or like all these guys? Like, there's a bunch of names. Like, you, <laughs> the fact is, these are like the fifth line players, and we're talking about John Tavares and Bo <laughs> Horvat. Yes. Um, the <laughs> the the Canadian team is going to be stacked, regardless, right? Like. We're talking Nathan McKinnon, maybe on the third line, sort of stacked. Um, so yep. I think I think so, just because of intangibles, almost right. Like he's he's a captain and he's a center, and you know he sort of checks all like the the perfect Canadian boxes. Um, mm -hmm. But I wouldn't be surprised to see him miss out. Right? Do they want to go with? you know, a Nick Suzuki, sort of a younger, higher offensive skill potential guy, um, mm -hmm. right? It, it depends on, on what direction they'll want to go. And it's crazy. This is like six months away, uh, the Olympics. So yeah. that'll be exciting. I remember uh, my son, Sean, as, as I mentioned before, caddied for Bo in one of our, the golf tournaments. And even then I asked Horvat, and this was back in 2016, I asked him, uh, you know, obviously 2018 was too soon. I said, uh, do you think you have a chance to make the Olympic team? And he goes, yeah, that's my goal. I mean, one of his goals yeah. must be Stanley Cup too, but it'll be, it'll be so cool to see him because he'll be the only Canadian, right? He'll, he'll be the only Canucks player on, on team Canada. We can have up to four on the team USA, maybe one or two on, on team Sweden, but yeah, he'll be the only Canadian player, uh, Canucks player on, on team Canada for sure. Mm -hmm. I hope so. It'll be cool. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Do you want do you have another one you want to put up here? No, if you got one, go for it. I don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. I'm looking through. No problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, ooh, maybe Thatcher Demko, says Edmund, uh, yes. on the on the U.S. side. Yeah, they could have Hughes, Demko, Besser, and Miller. Miller, I've seen, same as Horvat, on half of them so far. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm looking at Emily Kaplan's right now. Uh, yeah, she sort of has, she has Besser as like the fifth right wing oh. behind... 
Kane, Gensel, Debrinket, and Wheeler. Okay. Uh, I could see Besser knocking one of those guys out if he has a yeah. has a really good season this year. Um, and then on defense, Quinn Hughes as the fourth on the left side behind yeah. Slavin, Wierenski, and McDonough. Uh, again, I could see Hughes bumping one of those guys if, if he co- goes back to his previous caliber. Uh, yep. the, Kaplan does not have Thatcher Demko on, on her set. Uh, her goal is- she has Hellebuck, which I think is an absolute lock. Yeah. Uh, John Gibson, who could be, and yep. Jack Campbell, which is kind of interesting to me as the third goalie. I think I'd take Demko over Campbell I would uh, as my number three. Yeah. Interesting. And so JT Miller is not even on that list. Uh, Oh, JT Miller was four C. Oh, Oh, yeah. so in the mix oh, em- on this one, Emily throwing her, her hat in the ring for Miller to play as our third C, uh, for the Canucks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, what a great, That's funny. Uh, oh, and Halak on team Slovakia, maybe. <laughs> right. And then, and then Pedersen on Sweden, uh, maybe Ekman Larson. There's way better players than him now. Right. Like he won't make it. Uh, who knows? I think, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't keep track of Swedish defensemen. <laughs> very well. <laughs> um, what was another one here? I had it and I lost it. Uh, like, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, tiger asking, what do you think Klimovich's performance will be like this year? Hmm. He's talking like he wants to make the NHL in his first season as a second round pick. Poglander did it, but that was that was his a draft year later. plus one. Yes, his draft plus one year. I, I think it's great that that's just like Petey's talking like he wants to win. I think it's great that Klimovich is saying he wants to make the team. I don't see it happening. I think there's guys like Highmore or or even um, I, I, gosh, their names are escaping me. I, I, I some of our AHL depth guys that might have a better chance, of even a Nick Patan or some that could be the thirteenth forward ahead yeah. of uh, Klimovich for sure. Um, so, and there's nothing wrong with his, his, so then the question is, do you put him in that Abbotsford or do you do you put him in a, in a CHL? I don't know. You don't want him KHL. We saw what happened with Puck Holes. And I think that's, yep. a, yeah. So if I had to choose now, Parker, if I did, if I was a betting man, if I had to do a prop bet on if Klimovich is on the opening night roster, I say no. How about you? I agree. One yeah. of our, one of our prop bet questions is, I can confirm it is how many NHL games does Klimovich play this year? Um, right. Do they, you know, do they play him for a couple? Is it zero? Who knows? Uh, my belief is he probably just plays in the AHL all year, right? You've got guys like, you know, Will Lockwood that could potentially, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's right. yes. be an option. Um, yeah. I think they're, yeah, I think they've got guys that they'd rather get ice time and then let Klimovich hopefully go to the AHL and again, play on like the second line there and just rack up games, uh, in, mm-hmm. in a professional setting. I don't think you can go wrong there. Love it. Love it. I like both Bradley and Calvin's, right? The the latest ones. Both of those are fine. If you want to add those ones. Yeah. So great question. Prediction on Puck Holes' performance. If, well, I, I already know uh, on one of my vlogs, I said, if he's a third line player um, and, and there's talk of maybe him and Put- Pearson with Dickinson, maybe, and you keep Hulk, Ho- uh, Hulk Hogan, I almost said, Huglander with, Hor- <laughs> Hulk with Horvat and Garland. Well, you know something, brother. No, I think yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Pod Cole's in. I could see him get uh, twenty-five to thirty points on as a third liner. I'd be happy with that. I was going to say twenty-five was going to yeah. be my if he's on the third line. Uh, the prop think, bet. No, <laughs> it wouldn't be super exciting, but I think yeah. that would be probably about right. Um, yeah. Now, if he, you know, if he comes into training camp and is really impressive, and maybe you start to see him sort of, you know, Travis Green likes to pull out the blender every once in a while, right? I could see, you know, things not working out potentially on a line and, you know, maybe they throw him up on the first line with Pedersen and Besser for a game or, you know, do some weird things like that and see how he does. Um, So I say, yeah, if he sticks on the third line, 25 points is probably, you know, a pretty decent number. But if he starts to get shuffled on the lineup and if he's really impressive, then, you know, maybe he could shoot for a 35-40. But I wouldn't bet on it. Right on. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, then the second one from Calvin, uh, who has yeah. a, a Penguins logo as his, <laughs> as his YouTube avatar. Uh, we'll forgive him. Interesting choice. Uh, games played ratio between Demko and Halak. I'm going uh, two to one. Uh, so uh, two thirds, one third. So it's not perfect, but 55, 27 adds up to 82. That game started at least. So that's, that's what I'm going with. I think that's probably right in today's NHL, right? If it was, yeah. 
10 years ago, it would be like 63, 19, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so barring injury, I would say, yeah, I'd probably go like 57, 25 or something like yep. that. Again, the, I think, no, this isn't one of the questions on my on my prop bet list. <laughs> Never mind. It's uh, just just save percentages are on there. So start. Yeah, but bottom line, Halak's going to earn his $1.25 million bonus for appearing in 10 games for sure. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, lots of you guys making your predictions in chat. Wait, yeah, for the, like wait for the, the thing. Uh, it'll be in the next couple of weeks and we'll have it. You will, you'll have like three weeks to sign up. So, uh, make sure you are subscribed, uh, and oh, you I'm stay good. tuned for those. I saw Hulk, Hulk Olsen. <laughs> and yeah, silly silly Hulk. Hulk Olsen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what happens when you try and combine Puck Olsen and Hoglander's names together. That's what you come up with Hulk Hogan. That's what I did. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's 11. Do you want to wrap up or do you want to do one more? Uh, you know, let's go with no commentary because chats asked it twice about opening line lineup. I don't mind taking this real quick. Like I can, I can rip through it and we both have the same predictions anyways. Yeah. Okay. So Parker and I both agree. I also a third line, uh, third defense and we'll see. We both think it should be the lot of line Pedersen, Bester, Miller, then Horvat, Hoglander with Garland. Then Dickinson between Podkolzin and Pearson as your third line. And then a fourth line of Sutter, Mott, and let's say either Highmore or Lockwood. Then on the on the D, you have maybe Ekman Larson with Pullman, Hughes, Hamnick. Then you have Myers on the right. And then one of, as we talked about, Rathbone or or Hunt. Let's say for now it's Rathbone. Let's just say that. Then you have Demko and Halak. Your extras are Shen and one of Rathbone or or Hunt on, on D. So you have eight skater, eight defensemen, and your extra forward is going to be one of whoever doesn't play between Highmore and Lockwood. Let's go with that as of August 11th. Uh, Parker, is that fair to say? Love it. Okay, pretty much perfect. Dead on board with that. Good. All right, that is. Uh, I think that's it for us, folks. Um, again, we know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but there's uh, you know there's seventy of you in here. Uh, we appreciate you all yeah. spending the time with us on this Wednesday night in the dead of off season. Hopefully, we have something else to talk about next week that'll be a little bit more interesting. Uh, I'm thinking we might see some Jason Dickinson contract news. Um, hopefully one of Pedersen or Hughes, but again, I don't think Hughes is happening until training camp. Um, and we're getting closer. I mean, we're probably what a month away from training camp. I don't know the official mm -hmm. dates, but it's usually, you know, early September, early to mid September. Uh, so just a few more weeks, we got to fight through and, uh, and then we'll get to a lot. We'll have a lot of stuff to talk about come training camp. Yeah, absolutely. And Parker, I don't know if you have anything exciting going on this week. I am actually off to Victoria with my lovely wife, Gail. We're going to be there on Friday and Saturday, and I'm going to have a chance to meet a couple of my uh, YouTube members actually when I'm there, which is pretty, I'm excited about. Nice. So, yeah, that's my excitement. For, and then I have to go back to work on Monday. Boo. -hoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will be at work every day this week, uh, <laughs> but enjoy the rest of your vacation. Uh, for you guys listening, uh, if you missed any part of the show, I, I can see the chart. A lot of you guys hopped on about 10, 15 minutes late. If you want to jump back to the beginning of the show, you're on YouTube. So you can just scroll back to the beginning. If you're listening um, to the podcast platform, well, then you're already in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can also, for those of you who are still watching right now, you can find this on your favorite podcast platform. It'll be up within about an hour or two. Uh, we hope you had a, had a good time, a good night. And uh, as always, we will see you next Wednesday.